Uh, so, so for this project, this project seven, uh, the title, as you can see there, is learning random dynamical systems from data. So it's going to be two parts, uh, uh, first from uh, Torwani and then from Johnson, and the supervisors uh, were uh, Jerome Lama, and I think also as well as uh, Jesus Rosato. Okay. So Torwani, uh, thank you very much. Please go ahead. Hey, um, good day, everyone. I'm um, Torwani and. Um, I'm working on Project 7, Learning Random Dynamical Systems from Data, supervised by Professor Lam. I studied um, a class of maths from your Manville maths um, described as, and by the relation given above here. And this is a sample plot of the map um, for when alpha is equal to 2. This class of maths were first studied in 1980 in um, the paper by Pomio and Manville cited here and um, the main motivation for studying these maps are number one, the similarity between the dynamics of these maps and turbulent flow in fluid dynamics. And this is because this map show a uh, intermittent behavior and intermittent behavior in dynamical system is when, I mean, a dynamical system, we have some points where the orbit seems to be well behaved. Um, there seems to be no chaos and um, the, the orbit seems to move slowly, but then at some other points in the system, the orbits of some other points in the system are chaotic and the system suddenly becomes chaotic and begins to exhibit um, sensitive dependence on initial conditions and other properties of chaotic systems. And this is similar to what we see in turbulent fluid flow, where at some point the fluid um, the flow is smooth and um, there seems to be nothing going on, but at the point the flow becomes very turbulent. And so um, understanding this kind of maps could give some insight into what um, the mechanics of turbulent fluid flow. And the second motivation is that these maps are almost uniformly expanding. In fact, they are uniformly expanding at every point because at almost every point except at zero, the derivative of these maps is greater than one at every other point, except at zero where we have derivative one. And um, although this seems like a little variation, it brings about a large um, difference between how this class of maps are studied and how um, uniformly expanding maps are studied. To study this kind of maps, usually um, the induced map is introduced. Um, induced map is a map that is obtained from this map, which has um, better understood behavior and from the properties of the induced map, we can reduce the properties of this Pomeo Manville map. And now I move um, to discuss a bit about numerical approximation errors that I encountered when studying this kind of maps. Uh, because of sensitive dependence on initial conditions and computer random errors, it is um, not possible to get exact, exact points of the orbits for this map because um, by sensitive dependence on initial conditions, I mean two points very close together end up having completely different orbits. So a small difference in computation or a small computational error or approximation error could lead to completely different results for the orbit. For example, if we have a computer in a very good scenario that um, has an accuracy of up to 100 decimal places. So let's say we have a point X and we have um, and the computer um, gives an approximation of um, X plus delta, where delta is 10 raised to the power minus 100. That is a seemingly very small value. After n iterations, we have that by the mean value theorem, we have that the difference between these points become um, this value. If we assume that F prime of CI is 1.1, just a value a bit greater than 1 for each CI, then we see that after n iterations, we have this difference. But after 2,416 iterations, 1.1 raised to the power 2,416 is greater than 10 raised to the power 100 already. So for n greater than 2,416, we have a difference greater than 1. And this is a very large error already. So this makes it difficult to compute the orbit or to compute the trajectory of this system by using numerical um, 
simulation. And this is another example. This is the first return map for the home human bill map for alpha equals eight. And by construction, this should be a full branch map, but because of computational error, we don't have a full branch map. And by a full branch map, I mean um, each um, branch should map to the entire interval zero one. But we see that after some time, we begin to get some errors and we don't have a full branch map. Uh, so these are some of the limitations of um, trying to compute the trajectory of this system using numerical method. Then we ask, how do we study this maps then if we cannot compute their orbits? Um, but the interesting thing is that despite sensitive dependence on initial conditions, the statistics of this class of maps are very well behaved and we can study this using physical measures. And we measure mu is a physical measure. If for almost every X naught, the proportion of points of the orbit of X naught that lie in a set A converges to the measure of A. So the physical measure tells us the probability that the orbit falls in different subsets of the ambient space. So it gives us um, an understanding of the statistics of the system asymptotically after a long period of time. So if a physical measure exists, then we have information about the orbit of almost every point of the system. And um, so we asked, does the Pomeo-Manville map have a physical measure? Yes, it does. It is um, a well-known theorem that the Pomeo-Manville map has a physical measure for alpha between zero and one. And I'll quickly go through the proof. The proof is um, majorly um, is done by constructing the first return map, which is um, defined here. The first return match is full, map is full branch and has bounded distortion. And a full branch map with bounded distortion has a physical measure. So the first return map has a physical measure. And if we have, um, if um, mu at is a measure on the first return map, we can easily extend the measure to the original um, map, the original pomeo manville map by this relation. And if mu at is a physical measure, mu is also a physical measure. So we have a physical measure on the original system also. Um, now this is some um, numerical experiment. Here I plotted um, an histogram by dividing the interval zero one into 100 bins and computing the orbit of two differently, two different randomly chosen points. I actually um, computed the orbit for more than two points, but um, because of time, I will show just two. This is for 0 0.1 and um, this is for the point 0 0.4. And we see that they have, they seem to have similar distribution after this um, is about 200,000 iterations. And we see that they seem to have a similar distribution and we ask, um, why do we get similar plots for the different orbits? And also, are these plot plots accurate? Because like we said earlier, this kind of maps are difficult to study because are difficult to compute because of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. But we see that we have something similar. So we ask the question, can we rely on this result despite the um, numerical approximation errors that we are likely to encounter. Um, now I moved um, briefly to talk about, to discuss the results obtained by Stefano Galatolo and Isaiah Nisoli in their paper stated here. And, um, they actually um, use some rigorous computation and functional analytic methods to compute the density of the invariance measure on pomeo manville maps up to a given error. And um, they found that, yes, it is possible to compute this density up to a given error. And um, they used ULAMS method, which involves discretizing the transfer operator and then um, computing the fixed points, which will be the invariant density of the system. And um, once we have the invariant density, we have the measure because um, by radon nicodem theorem, since mu is an absolutely continuous measure, we can easily obtain the measure of any set using this relation. And we see that we have, um, and this is the plot they obtained in their paper. After the, um, using their method, the rigorous computation of the density, this is the plot of the density. However, we see that this is similar to what um, was obtained by 
just relying on the computational result and plotting the histogram. And we asked why um, is this reliable? Why um, is this correct? Because we know that there is a lot of computational errors. And, and this brings us to um, this um, conclusion that uh, perturbs maps with perturbations of given small multitude, magnitude have an invariant density that is close to the invariant density for the unperturbed is wise and expanding system. And this is a result obtained by M. Tanzi et al. cited here. And um, this is something that I hope to um, look forward to more to see exactly why this um, is so. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Toluwemi. Uh, so the next one would be uh, 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 Johnson. Are you ready? It's for, for the same project, but they, they, they look to, uh, to the same things. Uh, can you share? Yes, I'm doing it. Very good. Can you see my screen? Yes, that's perfect. So please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. I looked at the same project as Tolu learning random dynamical systems from data, but I looked at it from a different perspective. Uh, we'd like to answer the question that, given a partial observation of a system, can we actually determine the underlying dynamical system? Like you can see the time series on the left-hand side, it's a partial observation of, a, of the given system on the right. But assuming that we don't know, that the dynamical system on the right is that of the partial observation on the left. Is there a way that we can just reconstruct this dynamical uh, system or have some knowledge that this is the actual dynamical system just from partial observations? And then the by learning about the dynamical properties of these trajectories, we'll be able to, for example, do a model in low dimensional space with noise, instead of uh, doing modeling of the underlying dynamical system in dimensional space. And thereby we are saving cost of computation. Next, I talk about the modeling of random dynamical systems. There are different ways by which random dynamical systems can be defined, either by using stochastic differential equations or by adding direct, uh, additive noise to some discrete time mapping. Like you can see in the first set of equation above, this is the Lorentz system, the discrete mapping, but by introducing some noise, and some function that belongs to some probability distribution space, we can construct a random dynamical uh, system. Now, suppose that we have partial observation of a random dynamical system. Are we sure that we can learn about the dynamics Yes, we are sure by the takings embedding, it gives us the condition under which this reconstruction or reproduction of the underlying dynamical system can be constructed. This is the, we have access to some data or time series, y1 to y, up to yn. And then by the takings embedding, if we choose some delay, uh, coordinates that is twice as much, at least twice as much as the coordinate of the underlying uh, dynamical system. And if we choose our embedding coordinate and delay correctly, we'll be able to do this and be able to find, for example, the function that connects yn to yn minus tau and so on and so forth. So this, by this way, we will be able to learn the dynamical system and be able to reproduce it. So the dynamic uh, taking some embedding from a geometric perspective, 
I have some time series in a, some time series below, but it actually belongs to an n-dimensional manifold, but I'm not aware of this, that it belongs to an n-dimensional manifold. So taking this embedding tells me that I can construct a function, this uh, phi that acts on some uh, historic, on some embedding of the time series, and then reconstruct this dynamical system in an M-dimensional uh, manifold space, which is topologically equivalent to the original system, which I don't know. So for uh, experiment purpose, we have used neural network alongside Takin's embedding. So after we have used Takin's embedding to reconstruct dynamic R system, we want to use neural network to learn what the uh, Takin's embedding does and then use the results of its learning to make predictions. And the neural network actually learns the transfer function and to determine to determine the uh, solution of the nonlinear system, we describe some nonlinear transfer function between nodes. And then we are taking as input uh, the partial observation at SK and output at partial, uh, partial observation at SK plus one. And in between, there are some hidden layers. Specifically for the purpose of this work, we have used three hidden layers with 10 nodes in each uh, layer. So these are the results from uh, this definition of a random Lorentz system. So I took a partial observation of the random Lorentz system. So what does partial observation means? The random Lorentz system has X components, Y components, and Z components. So I just have access to say the X component alone and I want to be able to reproduce the entire system. Then I apply the takings embedding to the partial observation and uh, figure B is the embedding obtained. And starting from 100 different initial conditions, we also did something similar and got the embedded trajectories. But for this to actually work to get the um, right uh, embedding, we need to get the right embedding dimension and delay. So this can be used using uh, ideas of uh, mutual information of uh, first neighbor, uh, nearest labels to determine what is the correct dimension and the correct delay. And then this will work. So after the takings embedding has learned, or has reconstructed the underlying dynamical system, we now take the neural network, train the neural networks on the takings embedding reconstruction. And these are the results of the simulation of the predictions done. On the uh, left, on the right down corner, you can see, just a moment. So on the right down corner, you can see the prediction by the neural network in dashed lines and the prediction by the takings embedding in, uh, in thick lines. So the result seems to converge. And so this tells us that we can actually learn uh, the behavior of random dynamical systems from data. And these are the uh, evaluation results of the learning. The loss function is of the other 10 raised to the power of uh, minus two, which is significant enough. And this is the time series comparison simulation one and simulation two are the component-wise time series relation between the neural network and the random dynamical system.
So when we started this project, our goal was to know whether taking some embedding can actually learn random dynamical system and have an idea of the noise. And this we have implemented. Here are some of the references that I consulted while doing this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Johnson, and thank you, uh, Toluani, uh, for the presentation. I think we have uh, actually, we have time to uh, for uh, actually uh, ten minutes or so for uh, for questions. So, uh, colleagues and students, of course, go ahead and uh, if you have any questions, please. Uh, unmute your microphone and ask directly. I think I saw some, did I see some hands raised from, or maybe they were just applause? Yeah, I don't see uh, anything, but uh, okay. somebody share, please stop sharing that presentation. I have a question, but I'm happy to wait for getting student questions first. I don't think there are any hands raised, Mark, so go ahead. Okay, so. I think this problem of learning a random dynamic system is one of the most important problems because these random dynamic systems are used in so many disciplines to uh, model real world data generating processes. For example, also in economics, financial time series and, and stuff like that. So I wonder whether the results that you found are specific, for example, that learning Pumo, Mandeville type maps is is, is possible with fewer observations or whether there are some, some random dynamic systems which are, for example, harder to learn. So I, I imagine that it's, it's not a very general statement that one will find there. So for example, is logistic map type of maps, are these harder to learn than other maps or, or something like this? Um, for example, if you have a map which stays for a long time in a, in a, in a um, constrained part of the phase space and then jumps to somewhere else, I guess it's pretty hard to learn the correct dynamics here. Uh, yes, I hope to look into that, but I focused on Fumio Manuki maps. Maybe I can say something uh, if, if I'm allowed, even though I'm not a student. Uh, I, I think, Mark, you, you're, you're, you're pretty much right, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much onto this topic uh, for that reason that I think is very important. I think actually uh, the students yeah. have tried to do something, um, but it's not, it's not uh, easy. Uh, so what people do learn, if you have data, people learn deterministic rules, right? So people try to learn deterministic dynamics based on observations, and you have to hope that that's possible. So that's the usual target embedding. And also people try to learn... Uh, average properties of, of, of stochastic processes. That's also what people do. So they try to kind of somehow uh, estimate uh, um, average properties. But what's very little uh, done or not done, as far as I know, is that actually anyone tries to find out what's going, uh, what is really the random, random dynamic. So, and it's my perception that a lot of processes uh, are very well modeled by random dynamical systems and, and not just on this kind of average procedure, but actually basically on the trajectory base. And I don't know of anyone that actually really uh, uh, looks into this. And, and I think going for the average is, of course, nice, but it's, you lose a lot of information. And I think some of, much of the information is very important to understand actually what's really going on. And, and it's, a, it's a long-term objective. The project is basically uh, maybe a little bit uh, hard and the objective is a little bit impossible to, to, to try to explore uh, what one can, what one could do in this direction somehow, but I, I think it's it's really important because I think random dynamical systems are very important. People don't study them very much in some sense because people don't try to learn from data whether random dynamical systems are good models for uh, such data. And I think that as soon as we start doing that, we will find out that a lot of processes that are of interest, I believe, will be very well modeled by, by random dynamical systems, not just on the um, you know, on a kind of uh, a basis of averages and statistics, but basically also on the basis of trajectories. But people, but this is quite essential somehow. So there's a, there's a kind of a gap in, in what people do. And I think that's why the study of random dynamical systems is also somewhat under, under, understudied because uh, 
people say, well, okay, how, uh, you know, then people start looking at echotic, echotic theory and average properties and stuff like that. And people say, well, we don't need all this detail because it's not in the model usually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and with these average properties, you mean something like mean square deviation of these? Well, average properties is like deviation theory, uh, big of okay. observables, all this stuff. This is, of course, very well known that you can kind of extract this. But these are only projections of, of dynamical properties. This is not, there's lots of dynamical data that you cannot reconstruct from, from ergodic theory in some sense. So I think people are a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say lazy, but they just got so used to the fact that you can just look at these averages and, and average properties that the fine detail, which gets washed out by averaging, it gets lost in the process somehow. And I think that actually, if you look at these details in on this detailed level, you will find lots of very interesting things. Now, sometimes we don't have access to these details, so it's not relevant, but say in, in life sciences or medical data, you see people have a very detailed time series. So yeah. why would you average out all the fluctuations and to just get some kind of like average properties? You just lose information. And it's Especially my, if my, they are non-ergodic. There's, there's lots of issues there somehow, yeah, whatever you call it in some sense. But I think the dynamics, the time series themselves are very important. Um, and, and, and one... Yeah. Uh, and, 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 there was and, actually, a, there was an interesting uh, talk at the EE21 conference where somebody from the intensive care unit actually showed these uh, biomedical markers um, and that they have non-ergodic properties. So it's actually a big problem if you create, for example, some scoring rules for triaging based on these average properties, which then are never the case in any single individual. No, uh, it is of course due to the success of statistical mechanics in some sense, is that people are so used in statistics, is that people are so used to average everything and to assume all kind of properties. And this is, uh, yeah, but there's a lot of things to cover. But I think one thing is, is important that we can actually identify from observation certain processes that we can actually find out, for instance, low dimensional models with noise are very good models for to represent such data on a, on a pragmatic point of view. And, and this is mm -hmm. uh, n not existent at the moment, but I hope that it will come in a few years. It's an interesting thing, probably you also for scientific. Mark, this is interesting. It's, it's, oh, sorry. This is interesting, but there is already people want to, uh, to intervene. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, okay. of course. Sure. Uh, Leinar wants to have a question, so please, Leinar, go, go ahead. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, because uh, you're touching on a very important point here. Um, first of all, whether you were able to reconstruct or not, uh, to quite some extent, Jerome has mentioned it may depend on uh, the uh, properties of your underlying system, right? Whether you have strong chaos or weak chaos, meaning a positively up on exponent or not, and then add noise. And if I may make a um, brief advertisement of a talk tomorrow, actually, that is related to this, Tomorrow, Maitrich uh, Majumdar um, will talk about another random dynamic system which in fact exhibits a transition under the uh, strength of the random perturbation from a, a nice, simple uh, random dynamic system to a novel type of dynamics where you have actually ergodicity breaking. This is also what Jerome said, that you can really generate totally new type of random dynamics here. So there are very, very subtle issues here uh, that uh, are related. So that's also more tomorrow if you're interested. But there's another talk which comes into play here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lainar. Mark, we have a couple of more minutes. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I wanted those other people to speak. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm just wondering whether or it at least becomes clear to me now that probably in terms of scientific hygiene, if I see the next time that somebody models some em empirically stylized facts with a random dynamical system or with some dynamical system, that I would also like to see the, the story the other way around. So would you be able to actually detect this random dynamical system among a set of possible models uh, given the, the observation? So uh, I just found this a very interesting and nice topic as a, as a student project. and. In a universe of many, many other uh, learning, learning projects. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, again, I apologize for, for interruption from my part. And I wanted to say from my from, from my side that uh, I, I think it depends a bit on the on the research area where you you can say where this thing has been studied or not. Okay, I, I can point out, but maybe we can discuss this thing later. In certain areas where. So you try to do an inference based on the trajectory of a dynamical stochastic system, okay? And this has applications, for instance, in the calibration of, of, of optical tweezers or even a, a model, model selection, okay, for a sto stochastic dynamics of Brownian type particles. Anyway, so let me uh, stop.